All right. Welcome everyone to a webinar about um, design counterfeits and how to battle uh, battle them and, and other IP infringements, especially in an online environment. Um, I will go over just a couple of housekeeping uh, things before we jump into the um, actual uh, topic of today. So this, um, uh, this webinar will be recorded uh, and and will be uh, available as a as a recording after after this uh, this webinar. And uh, in case anyone doesn't want to be uh, heard or seen in in the recording, so so then um, uh, please just uh, make sure that your your mics and and videos are are muted the the whole time. Uh, otherwise, during the presentations, we have uh, participants um, muted. Uh, but after after the presentation, uh, we will have time for for questions and and discussions. And very much welcome welcome this um, in in the in the latter part of the the webinar. And before we we jump into a uh, short uh, introduction to designers' intellectual property rights, uh, I I would like to. Uh, um, just uh, give our our fantastic experts and expert guests today an, an opportunity to um, to introduce themselves. Uh, so maybe maybe first uh, Marianna um, Karjan Lahtiperini, if you can shortly um, tell tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, thank you. First of all, thank you guys for having me here today. Um, so my name is Marianna. Uh, I come from, I, I work in a law office, um, attorneys a law office in Helsinki, Finland called Vaselius. Been with Vaselius now for, I think, four years. Uh, been working with uh, trademarks, designs and domains, uh, the protection and enforcement of these, these rights now, uh, at least over 10 years. Um, enjoying it very much. Intellectual property rights are a, a very interesting field. Um, for the past few years now, I've been uh, involved with EUIPO's um, um, projects in relation to SMEs, so how to provide more information on intellectual property rights registration and, in general, uh, information about them for the small and medium size size companies. So that's been uh, close to my heart recently. Iris, you are mu muted there still. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Marianna, for for the presentation. And and then next, uh, maybe Cecilia and and Clara from from Silka. You can you can tell about yourselves and your your current uh, roles. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having us uh, as well. We're really excited to be here. Uh, my name is Clara and my colleague Cecilia is here next to me. Uh, so we run a very small firm, 15 people, um, headquartered in Stockholm. But we have branches in New York and London as well. Um, and we specialize solely on taking down websites and um, disputing domain names. So well, we do a lot of different kind of takedowns, but websites are the main one. Uh, and we, yeah, our specialty is that we cover all countries, all the top level domains. So um, yeah, our clients are typically like large international companies with uh, consumer brands. Um, let's say anything else you should tell Cecilia. Uh, I think you covered most of it, but I yeah. think we've been in this industry for, I don't know how many years, I'm afraid to start counting, but we've had this uh, this firm for at least 10 years, so yeah. Yeah, well, we have filed, I think this, we have filed over 1,000 domain name disputes, and we, uh, we have 120% of them, so we have quite a lot of experience of uh, disputing domain names. Yeah, I think that's all. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, very, very happy to to have you all here. And then we will uh, also hear a little bit about, um, or a little bit from my my colleague Rosa Joensu. So Rosa, you can also also uh, introduce yourself. Yes, thank you. Hi everyone. I'm Rosa. I work at Orna Martin Design Finland with Iris uh, as a lawyer, where I advise designers 
on intellectual property rights, contracts, employment matters, for example. And I'm specialized in intellectual property law, uh, especially trademarks and designs. That's all from my part, and I <laughs> give the floor back to Iris. All right, thank you so much. Um, uh, now I think um, the presentation is is should be on on sharing mode again, and um, as as mentioned, I uh, I will give a, a pre presentation on on. Um, Um, on the intellectual property race, just a second. I am I'm trying to get the the sharing function properly, properly back on. Yes. Okay. I think now now we're back on track on the on the presentation mode. So uh, I've introduced Ornamo um, in, in our previous webinars, uh, but just a few words uh, about, about Ornamo for, for those who are unfamiliar with, with who we are and what, we, what do we do. Ornamo is an uh, association of professional designers, and we represent uh, a bit over 3,000 uh, individual designers who work in, in all, all fields of, of design. And Ornamo offers uh, a variety of, of professional uh, services for for our members. And this uh, webinar is part of a, a, a webinar series and, and a project that we are uh, currently um, uh, co cooperating with, with our uh, European umbrella organization, the Bureau of European Design Associations, uh, BEDA, and, and our, uh, our joint project and, and collaboration aims at empowering designers and small and medium-sized enterprises to utilize the, the full potential of their creative and innovative work with the help of intellectual property rights. And this, this um, project and webinar series is funded by uh, EUIPO, so the European Union Intellectual Property Office. And you can find more information about uh, this, this project and, and pro project materials uh, on, on both Ornamos and Pedas webpage. And um, here, here is the, the list of the, the, the webinars that are part of this, this series. So, so we're currently in, in, in the third uh, webinar of this series already. And the previous ones about uh, design protection and uh, design licensing are available as, as recordings on, on uh, our YouTube channel. And you're very, very welcome to um, sign in for, for the last uh, webinar series uh, coming up in, in two weeks, which is actually going to be hosted by, by, by my colleague, uh, Rosa. Um, and just, just to uh, include uh, other materials in, in our project here, um, uh, we, we are currently, um, we have a, a, a survey going on, uh, especially directed at designers uh, about um, how do you utilize intellectual property rights uh, and how familiar you are with the, with the topic. So, so please, if you have a chance to take, take a few minutes, it's, it's, it's quite the short, short survey, um, if, if you can answer a, a few questions. And we do also... Um, uh, for for everyone who wants to leave their their conf contact information, we we have a uh, a, a gift certificate um, draw for that, and and the contact information care, uh, um, taken in this in this survey is, is used solely for the, for that purpose. And then additionally, we have made an introduction video to intellectual property rights for designers. So it's it's a twenty minute video that gives a pretty pretty quick overview of, of the topic to those who are um, less familiar with, with um, uh, intellectual property rights. And also, as I mentioned, the, the previous uh, webinar recordings are available on YouTube. So um, I will give a, a very, very simple uh, and, and simplified overview of, of designers' intellectual property rights here so that everybody who, who joins in has, has an, uh, an, an overview, overview of, the, of the topic and then kind of understands 
uh, where, where we're focusing on, on a bigger picture uh, today. So when it comes to um, uh, intellectual property rights, uh, of course, the, the first first part is to really identify what kind of intellectual property one has and then uh, what, what could uh, be uh, protected with intellectual property rights. And um, from the designer's point of view, this, this process typically starts with, with some kind of an idea or concept, whether it's, it's, um, it's the designer who came up with that or there's a customer or user um, um, uh, input for, for that, that concept. And based on that, that concept, there's typically a some kind of uh, model or design that's, that's created. And uh, in in case that that model uh, becomes a a product or a service, then that is is um, that can be then sold to to customers. And then from the the customer's point of view, um, it, it can sometimes be challenging to to um, uh, view which which product is made by by who and and comes from from its source and and um, uh, as 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 we we most most here probably know sometimes it happens that similar products or similar brands are being offered in the market and um, it, it it can even be be challenging for from the customer's point of view to really really know who's behind these these products and and brands. And then if we, we view this from the designers or the design company's point of view, um, we, we have the, the design, which in itself is intellectual property, but obviously there are other, um, other uh, intellectual property uh, uh, typically in, in a design company. So there's, there's typically some kind of uh, sales, sales channels. And in this case, since we are especially focusing on, on, on the online channels, there, there are typically domain names. Uh, there are some online um, sales uh, portals where, where the, the products or services are being sold. And in order to identify uh, the the product or the designer or the design company that's uh, offering these these products, there's typically some kind of uh, brand and name uh, indicators that are that can be protected with trademarks, and of course then. Um, trade secrets uh, uh, and contracts and and even just the overall good, goodwill that the the company or designer is able to create uh, is is part of the 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 bigger intellectual property or the intangible assets uh, that the the designer has and then second it is the uh, the the question of what to what to protect from from the uh, this pool of intangible assets and and so um this is this is something that we discussed again a bit more especially in the in the first um uh webinar and also in in the in the introductory uh video of, of designers intellectual property rights but but here is an example of of, of one single product and the the, the var variety of ways that that can be uh protected and what those uh, different uh, forms of, of uh, intellectual property rights, so trademarks, designs, copyright, and, and patents in, in this example could protect uh, when it comes to uh, a, a single single product. So there are always a lot of um, uh, a lot of different uh, options for um, uh, protecting even even just one one single product, and of course, then uh, the the difficult part is really deciding what uh, which which parts uh, and and which features uh, could and should be protected. And then um, yes, here's just a, a quick quick overview of, of a few of the differences of these uh, different type of uh, intellectual um, property protection forms. And uh, the the differences in in for example the the, the uh, protection uh, time that that they offer, and then uh, here is one example of of a way to to look at a product and in, in terms of what kind of uh, competitive edge uh, does this product have over other similar products in the market, and the, typically there's some kind of um, 
some kind of features. And then uh, in, in this example, there, there are a couple, couple different features that, that then uh, um, can help to, to really pinpoint which aspects really um, uh, should, be, should be protected. But as mentioned uh, today, we, we don't have the uh, opportunity to uh, dive too deeply into, into this. So just to give an, an overview to the, the topic. And then, of course, there's the, the question of how to utilize these, these rights. And, and again, there are many, many ways that designers typically utilize their intellectual property rights, starting from um, uh, the production part and manufacturing agreements with, with the manufacturer, uh, resale, and of course, um, very, very typical to, to license uh, some of those, those uh, assets and intellectual property rights, or, or in some cases, uh, transfer, transfer those rights. And as mentioned, we, we discussed licensing in, in, in more detail in the, in the previous uh, webinar. And then uh, it's, of course, very important to uh, enforce and, and manage those intellectual property rights, which is the part that we are focusing more uh, today. And uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, from, um, from the market point of view or the customer's point of view, uh, it's, it's Im important to be able to know uh, where do these products come from and from the designer's point of view, to be able to uh, prevent others from making and bringing to the market products uh, or, or brands that are uh, too similar to, to theirs and, and intellectual property rights are the tools that um, uh, can be used in these uh, situations, as we will hear more from our uh, guests today. Um, and, and of course, part of the um, in enforcement and management processes, then of course, uh, also to remember to, to renew these these rights, and today we're we're especially focusing on the on the online environment. And um, as uh, as mentioned before, it's 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 very typical nowadays that there are are uh, some forms of online uh, sales sales channels used, and so um, typical situations that designers um, uh, can can face uh, during during their. Um, careers is that somebody else is is offering uh, in an online environment um, their product with with their brand name uh, or they're um, offering a, a similar product even though if they use a different different brand or in some cases utilizing their brand uh, even though the product would be would be this dissimilar and um, this is of course undercutting uh, all of the uh, all of the creative and innovative work that has gone into creating these uh, these designs and these intangible assets and uh, and, and and typically the 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 products that are that are being offered offered um, uh, that are that are not uh, made uh, by by the designer or or their uh, partner uh, are are undercutting costs and typically utilizing uh, a, a cheaper a cheaper materials and and worse uh, manufacturing uh, in in environments. And um, yeah, this is uh, how how to battle uh, these these situations is is the topic that we are focusing on on today on on this kind of bigger bigger picture. And um, yes, uh, now I will uh, give the floor to my my colleague um, Rosa Joensu, who will who will share a little bit about um, uh, the the impact of of these these counterfeit products on our uh, society. So, yes, now. Yes. Thank you. I will share my screen. Can you see it now? Okay, good. So I will briefly talk about the negative effect counterfeit products have to the EU uh, market and consumers. I refer to a recent study by the European Union Intellectual Property Office, which was published in, in January this year. And they looked at, at three sectors, 
clothing and footwear uh, industry, cosmetics industry, and toy industry in the EU. And uh, the study found that annually uh, approximately 16 billion euros are lost uh, in sales due to counterfeit products, uh, 12 billion in clothing and footwear industry, 3 billion in cosmetics industry, and 1 billion in toy industry. And it's not only sales that are lost, but also EU jobs, nearly 200 thousand uh, jobs uh, lost annually and uh, here you can see the the numbers by the sectors and, and uh, I will also show show the table let's see here uh, this is from the same report and uh, here you can see by what the numbers were were by sector and and how many how many jobs were lost and, and how much sales were lost uh, due to counterfeit products in the EU market. And on the bottom, you see the EU total. I will uh, put the link to this, this study and this report in the webinar chat. So if you want to take a closer look at the numbers later, you can, you can find it there. But as we see here, the the impact is very big, and and this is a very important important topic. And I also want to highlight that it's not only the economic impact and the lost sales and jobs in the EU market, but counterfeit products also pose other very significant risks to uh, EU market and EU consumers. Uh, by, for example, fueling organized crime. Uh, there are um, various environmental risks and health and safety risks to consumers. Uh, we saw that toy industry is among the most affected uh, ones by the counter counterfeit products. Uh, and uh, there is, there is uh, of course, then also health and safety of children uh, in question. So this is a very big problem also in that regard. Also, the report uh, shows and the study found that, that uh, it poses a risk of undermining the trust in the rule of law. Uh, recently, there have been some trends, uh, especially in social media, where it has been considered um, maybe cool or recommended to find uh, fake products that are cheaper, but especially these risks are often forgotten or maybe consumers don't even know about these risks we find counterfeit products so I have to also highlight highlight this here but this was just a brief introduction to today's topic from my part uh, I want to thank thank you all and uh, I hand back to Iris Thank you, Rosa. And now we have a, a, a pleasure to hear from from Marianna and uh, and your experience in how to how to battle these these counterfeit situations. Yes, thank you to you both for the introduction and also Rosa for providing a, a important information. Uh, unfortunately, the numbers on counterfeits are not not very pleasant one at all let me share my my screen um my presentation you can see it now i hope yes we can good okay so i'm just gonna start um we're talking about today the how to battle ip infringements uh enforcement of ip but we cannot do that before uh, we have talked about the actual rights or products behind it, because there is no infringement or there is no enforcement if there is not intellectual property rights. And today we're closely reviewing on design rights as the intellectual property rights. So as he has also mentioned, it is essential to understand it is essential to understand and recognize your rights. So design registration 
It protects your design's appearance, which will results from lines, contours, colors, shape, texture, materials of the product. It can be whole, the protection can cover the whole product, or it's important to remember that it can be only a part of a product. Uh, for receiving protection and the right to exclude others, design should be new and individual character when the application for the registration is applied. Our registered design gives an exclusive right to the commercial exploitation to that product's appearance that has now been registered. The good thing about registering your designs is that it provides a clear legal basis for you to enforce your right in case of infringement. And it is uh, easier to take legal action when you have a registered right behind you. Obviously, uh, overly simple and very ordinary designs cannot be registered. And these could be, for example, be basic geometric shapes, such as like balls or squares or, or uh, ordinary grids, stripes. However, also, for example, a stripe when positioned in in a in a product somehow unordinary way and maybe combined with some other or unordinary shapes could then again be uh, registered as a as a design i have some um i have few examples here so I have included, for example, Fisker's scissors. There is a, a paper tissue in the middle. These are all commun registered community designs, so covering EU. There is a Genelec um, a speaker. It's a bottle. And here uh, um, you can see that only a part of the product has been um, registered with the design uh, community design registration it's the bottom of the shoe so the upper part of the shoe uh, it has been lined with dots which means that the protection is not applied to the upper part of the shoe but only part of the product which is now the bottom in this case when filing a when filing a, um, a design registration um, you submit or you can submit several photos of the of the design. And here, for example, we have a sector design lamp where there is protection has been uh, um, uh, applied for different angles of this lamp. And therefore, there is um, for, uh, pictures of of each angle of it. In addition to understanding what does your rights cover, what has been protected with the design registration, it's important for you to understand also the geographical scope of the protection. So where do you manufacture? Where do you sell? Where do you market? Do you need national registered design rights or in several countries or in one country? Or would you need a registered community design with a unified protection in all of the EU countries? As an example, I have here um, application fees for Finland um, and also the renewal fee. As you can see, they are not that high when you consider that maximum de uh, a design registration can be, for, uh, can be valid for 25 years. It has to be renewed every five years. So there is a renewal fee for that for 380 in Finland. Also, the SME fund um, that has been upheld by the EU IPO can assist uh, financially small and medium-sized enterprises in regards to registering a trademark or a design. Um, I, this uh, has the fund is closed for for this year, but it should uh, reopen again in January. And as you can see, the reimbursement 
for filing a design, for example, it's 75% of the official fees. Then if you have not registered design rights, all hope is not lost at that time yet. So there is also an unregistered community design that receives protection for a period of three years from the date on which the design was made available to the public. This is important. So it cannot be that from, uh, the, the three years starts from the first time it has been made available to the public and is valid only for three years. The possible problems in enforcing uh, non-registered, unregistered community design is that the owner must be able to show that the design became known to the public less than three years ago. And also, obviously, that the design is of uh, an individual nature. Um, no infringement, in, infringement occurs if it is determined that the second design here, the design that you consider is infringing, is a resu result of an independent creative work. And the creator of that work could have not been expected to know about your design that, that it has been published. So then, nevertheless, you cannot enforce your rights. In general, the scope of protection for our community design is more limited than for our registered community design. Also, in relation to online marketplaces, unregistered community designs are obviously more vulnerable. We have cases where Chinese companies have, for example, filed community design applications to register designs that are counterfeits or lookalikes of designs that have not had uh, registration. And they are using these certificates to sell their products in large online marketplaces. And with these registrations, they are also then able to pluck the original products from those places because they have the registration and the original product did not. This has been a very unfortunate development. So when we now then consider that we have done our registrations, for example, let's go to preventive measures that how you can use your rights to prevent counterfeits going around online. Firstly, the like online marketplaces and e-commerce stores. Uh, large online marketplaces and e-commerce stores, they have different kind, different developed tools for intellectual property right holders to proactively monitor, report, and to re remove infringing listings done by uh, the infringers. For example, Amazon has this brand registry that works more of a monitoring tool. So by submitting data of your products and in intellectual property rights, Automated protection removes or flags third-party listings that may be considered infringe your registered rights. So this is Ben measure. To be eligible for an Amazon brand registry, you must have a registered trademark or design right in each country where you wish to enroll. Uh, I noticed that this is now a UK authority website, but I had to, I, I put the link on because there was a very nice listing on other uh, larger online marketplaces, Amazon, Alibaba, eBay, also the newcomer, uh, Temu, just to, few, just to name a few of their tools, how you can either have this kind of monitoring or then removing infringing products from their websites. Secondly, I would like to introduce the application for custom surveillance. So application for custom surveillance can be filed for national borders or it can cover, example, the EU borders. The, to file this application, it's, it's free of charge. This is obviously can be done also in China, in the US, but I'm sure in those cases you would need um, 
at least in those cases, you would need an attorney, a local to help you filing those applications. So there are costs in relation to that. What these applications done is the customs tries to stop the counterfeit goods entering the country based on the information provided in the application. So you can provide uh, information to the customs of photos of the products, photos of your designs. You have to have intellectual property rights registered or then also copyrights. You can provide information of legit importers, exporters, that they move your goods. And also, if you are aware of any of the parties that have been importing counterfeits of your products, the country, you can also inform those so the custom knows to monitor them more closely. The application is valid for one year after which it can be renewed. You always have to have a valid uh, in uh, like registered right when doing that. Obviously, a small um, a small shipments can go much more easily unnoticed than a larger container shipments. But nevertheless, uh, it uh, it is a it is a good tool for trying to prevent the 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 counterfeits for entering the countries. Um, thirdly, I want to talk about agreements, especially in relation to design molds. So you need to remember to clarify your rights in relation to design molds. Exclude factor that the, the, the that these rights, the agreements would exclude factories from using your molds for any other purposes than agreed in the agreement. So this can be that they cannot use it to anything else except for your products, but this has to be clarified. Also, what needs to be taken into consideration is that what happens to the molds after the agreement ends? Are they returned to you? Are they destroyed? What happens to the molds? Possible other measures. The ones that I, I was now talking about, they don't necessarily uh, increase your costs. There's no necessary service costs in relation to those. In these, now, yes, monitoring services. You can have, there is a lot of uh, companies offering monitoring services where there is a marketplace watch for counterfeit infringing products. There's social media watch, channeling, scanning the Facebook, Instagram, and there's also design right watch, so which then scans um, registered app design applications, what the third parties, maybe your competitors, what they are doing. In addition, uh, I'm mentioning the digital watermarks for design, uh, digital designs. So this is an inv invisible markers embedded in the digital files to identify and track ownership. Um, this could provide a clear proof of ownership in case of counterfeits or unauthorized use of your products. They enable global tracking of designs across online platforms. And But this uh, embedding and tracking watermarks effectively may require technical uh, expertise. So then let's move forward to enforcing your rights and actions against infringer. So what can you do if you detect a product or that you consider is infringing yours? Well, firstly, you have to evaluate that there actually is an infringement. You have to consider that your rights and the, the infringing product. The ev evaluation is between, so the two designs, infringing design, your design, or the product and product, it's done side by side, comparing their similarities on features and overall appearances. What is essential is the overall appearance of the design. And usually a design cannot be considered to have an individual character, which is a base for a registration, if it only differs from previous known designs in some minor details. 
So you have to evaluate how strong your design is, the registration is, and then also um, the order of these two products. Infringement occurs when the overall appearance of the designs is either too similar or it can be also identical and therefore leading to a confusion among informed users. So the evaluation of the infringement is done through the eyes of an informed user. And this informed user is a hypothetical individual who has knowledge of the relevant sector where the designs in this sector that the designs are in and pays particular attention to designs, but is not an expert. So if we think about, for example, um, um, a fashion um, a a design in, in fashion industry, the informed user is a person that is interested in fashion and follows fashion, but it doesn't work in fashion. So it's not an expert on it. In addition, several other factors are considered uh, and importantly, I will mention the freedom of designer and technical functions. So design, sorry, design does not protect those features or design registration does not protect those features of a product appearance that are solely dictated by a product's technical function. These technical functions also hinder the free, freedom of creation of the designer. Well, this means that the freedom of creation, for example, for a, let's say a shoe, is, is because of these technical functions only limited to the extent that the shoe must be designed to follow, for example, the ergonomics of a foot. Uh, it has, shoe has to be a supportive one. It has to allow a stable stance and being comfortable to the use. So appearances arriving from these kind of mandatory technical um, features uh, may not get protection to registration. And therefore, you cannot enforce uh, to an infringer these, uh, these kind of features. But if you think about shoe again, nevertheless, the designer has the freedom to choose, among other things, the shape, um, how, the length of the of the shoe, the design, the arrangement of any individual parts, portions, patterns, and any decorative elements on the shoe. And those can, again, then be registered or protected by a registration. And you can enforce those kind of uh, overall appearances of the shoe against an infringer. Again, I remind you that uh, it doesn't have to be a whole product that is protected. It can also be a, just a part of the product. So when we have considered that there is now, I mean, in, in, your, your design has been infringed, what do you do? So you, you contact the infringer, you send a cease and desist letter, which is a form and written demand to the infringer who is manufacturing or marketing and selling your infringing products. Remember that this can also be a reseller that you are sending the CCs and desist letter. This letter should contain information on your existing design rights and their scope, also the geographical scope. So, so that the infringement, you can establish that the infringement is happening. I'm I'm selling my design here, in, and the infringer is also set or getting the infringing products in Finland. Information on why the party's products is infringing your rights. So that was the evaluation part. You don't have to go into details like deep details because you have to keep the balance on on kind of if there will be a court case later on but nevertheless, so that you are clear and precise. You can ask how many products have been already sold. You can 
decide, you have to decide on what do you want to happen with the remaining infringing products. These all are relation to what are going to be the compensations. You should also ask for uh, information on the manufacturer. If it's if you know that this uh, infringer you are contacting is only now marketing or selling them, who is the actual manufacturer? Where did these uh, counterfeit products arrive from? And then if there is possible, other resellers. There's a possibility that the infringer just ignores your letter or challenges and says that it, it doesn't agree that it has been infringing your products, which then has to be considered if uh, further legal actions, namely corporate proceeding, will be the next step. Good. Uh, in, uh, at the same time, I know... Um, our other speakers, they will be talking more about the takedown notices. Um, I will mention at the same time, as I said already earlier, for example, larger online uh, online retailers, uh, they have platform specific to, uh, uh, procedures to uh, remove uh, infringing contact from an online retailer's website. So if you have uh, you can provide information that it they it, it is your design being infringed, then you have right to that design. Then at the same time already when sending the cease and desist letter, contacting the infringer, this is something that should be done. Trying to get the products out from the online retail website. Um, in connection to enforcement, we should also talk about other intellectual property rights than just design rights. Um, combining design rights together with the trademarks um, ensures a stronger protection, I guess, online, in, uh, online infringers. So trademarks are an important tool for protecting your design. And a strong trademark helps to establish a brand recognition. The trademark tells the consumer from who the product, the design originates from. And also one of the trademarks function is a quality function. And the quality function indicates to the consumer of the certain level of quality of the product that is being sold under that trademark. So that they com can kind of combine already that if, if there is a counterfeit product on the market and the quality of that product is terrible, nevertheless, that they recognize the design or the trademark, they should know already that it's not yours because the quality is terrible. Other intellectual property rights that may be used in an in a infringement and enforcement situation are obviously copyrights. Um, and then there is also possibility of uh, a Clean Fair Business back, uh, Practice Act in relation to these. Um, in the end, I want to mention the power dynamics. So taking legal action against infringers can carry a reputational risks, particularly if the target of the infringement is a small business. When a bigger um, or target of the infringement, so weirdly, weirdly said. So, but the court of public opinion, so to speak, uh, is is uh, is quite can be quite cruel also. Um, so you have to remember to to always to choose your choose your um, letters wisely and and to have a perception of what is your rights. That's maybe the most important thing also in this. Um, the public's opinion on infringement may not always be the same as the legal one. Because it's it's of, often believed that large companies, for example, have an advantage on IPR disputes. 
However, the outcome of an IPR case depends more on the legal strength of the claims rather than the size of the company. Thank you. I, I will uh, take more questions. I think questions later on. That, that is what we agreed, uh, wasn't it true? Huh? Yes, I think we could we could take the the remaining uh, presentation by Cecilia and Clara from from Silka, and then then we will have uh, a chance to chance to ask and and uh, and hear more from from the experts. But yes, thank you, Mariana, yes. very much for for your uh, presentation. And uh, yes. next, I'd like to welcome uh, Cecilia and, and Clara from from Silka. To share their representation. Thank you. Share the let's see if I have the right one. So I'm just going to stop sharing. Um, <laughs> so, so I can uh, just recap in the meantime. Um, so our presentation is going to be not so focused on design as, uh, as we heard until now, but more generally how we can take down websites and you know, a lot of our clients are uh, pharmaceutical companies where we sometimes for my own you know the look of the uh, the pill or the packaging um other than copyright and uh, copyrighted images and obviously if it's counterfeit kind of products if we have evidence of that um okay um to see that now we see the whole screen <laughs> yeah is it yeah is it yeah, working okay. now i wasn't sure yeah. Yes, it's working. Perfect. Okay, great. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Technicalities. Okay, great. So oh. we are. Yeah. So we, uh, we already mentioned this. We started 10 years ago, um, this company, and we had already worked for 10 years with the Dominions previously. So we're very niche uh, focused on checking our websites to either uh, take down processes, which we're going to talk about more, and also domain name disputes where we have filed a lot. Uh, we cover all. All countries. So everything we talk about here is is purely administrative processes. We, we don't go to court. Uh, so this is uh, yeah applies to all countries. So enough about us. So we're going to talk uh, first. We're going to have a quick look at some examples, um, which I'm sure you've all seen examples on the internet. Um, but then we're going to take a look at takedown versus domain disputes. What can we use when? Uh, obviously, you can uh, have an idea of when you can use domain disputes, but when can you? Uh, then we'll look at how to find these infringements and then go a bit more specifically on how to take down websites and, uh, and uh, file disputes. Uh, we're not going to go so much into how to file disputes, more like when can it be a good idea to do that also, or instead of just taking down the website. And then we'll wrap up with the final recommendations and then any questions you may have. Also, if you come to think of any other questions, of course, you know, feel free to contact us anytime. All right, so some examples of infringements. We're going to go into detail on these ones later on. So this is just a, a quick look. These are not companies that we work with, so we're not showing our clients uh, the cases. Uh, so see that we'll get into these in detail later. So what can we do and when? Um, a domain name dispute, um, the outcome of that is that the complainant will uh, gain ownership of the domain name, which will in turn disconnect the website, which was probably infringing upon some of rights. Um, so that outcome is permanent, like ownership gets transferred, complainant has full control over that domain name, the address. Um, there are pros and cons of both these. We'll look at them in the end. Um, sorry, please go back a little bit. See that. Um, uh, there. Um, a website takedown, on the other hand, is um, you shut down the website that's connected to this domain name. Um, it's quick, but not necessarily mm. permanent. So we're going to look at so website takedown can be done both on domain names uh, that contain the brand. Or not. So now we can look at some example. I think we have some animations here. Maybe we need to. Yeah. So this is an example we're going to look at later. The Merck Group um, is a domain name that was 
created and the, also the website was taken down. We often do in yellow. Um, so just to understand when you can apply what, um, we need to look at what exactly is the domain because there's uh, often uh, misconceptions about what can be disputed in a domain name dispute. Um, as you can read here, um, the domain name is whatever comes before the dot, directly before the dot. So in this case, Merck Group. Uh, those are the only domains we can dispute. The trademark it needs to be somewhere in the domain name in some form, in case spelling or uh, combination, or but it has to be uh, conclusively similar to the trademark in some way. Um, then we also have the, these are just examples of Merck.group.me. I don't think that exists. Um, but we sometimes get questions like, hey, can we dispute this domain name? No, we can't. Uh, it's called Merck because this is a subdomain. Uh, and that's a whole other question. Um, you know, what can you do about those? We could probably do uh, a takedown on that specific subdomain. Sometimes we do that too. Um, but we cannot dispute it. So the only thing we can do there is a uh, takedown. So I was going to talk about how, how do these infringements get detected. I'm sure you will have experience of it, but some, some tips. Uh, yeah, so there are different ways uh, to detect, you know, whether your IP rights are violated online. Um, so it could be, sorry, I was jumping ahead. So it could be uh, either through a, a monitoring watch. I think Mariana mentioned that previously. Uh, it could be a watch that identified domain names, uh, including your trademark, or it could be a service that monitors your logo, any copyright material that is being used by third parties. And uh, violations, they can also be reported by loyal customers, if you're fortunate. Uh, so if they see this uh, behavior or websites that they feel are not authentic, they may report it to the brand owner. Um, it's quite common also that they think they have access to the website and then they realize it's actually counterfeit goods that they purchased. So, so many customers, uh, they would go directly to the brand owner and, and let them know can also be someone internally uh, detecting a site which is not authorized by the company. So I guess depending on your financial resources and many large companies, they already have some sort of surveillance and monitoring in place. So it depends how, I guess, how global your brand is. It could really be worthwhile uh, looking into having a monitoring service in place just for, for early detection and also early, early action. So some commonly used enforcement methods. So once you have detected, a, so to speak, like a bad website, uh, then you need to decide what is the most effective enforcement measure in your particular case. So this can obviously vary. Uh, so it could also be sending a cease and desist letter or a demand letter, as Mariana mentioned previously. Uh, you can ask for a modification of the website or removal of, of specific content. Um, it could also be that you go directly to the actual web host uh, or the domain name agency asking them to either shut down the web, entire website or suspend the domain name. So there are different options. Uh, you can also file a domain name dispute uh, if you're able to fulfill the criteria for, for winning a dispute and that varies from, from country to country. Uh, so which measure to actually use really depends, I'd say on the severity of the infringement. Um, so each of these options, we'll, we'll discuss them further down, down the presentation. So let's play with the thought that you have now a website that you wish to remove. So first, obviously identify if there is an IP infringement. Um, and I would recommend to first see um, where the actual website is hosted. And we're not gonna talk about marketplaces today. We're gonna talk about actual websites. So, so I'd say go and see what the web host terms and conditions uh, state, because often the web host, if it's a larger web hosting company, they usually have a process in place to, to handle any potential, let's say copyright claims or other type of abuse. They also have quite often, I'd say, they have something called an acceptable use policy or AUP, as we like to call it um, on their website that refers to how content can be used when, when you sign up using their services. So 
So if it's in breach of their acceptable use policy, uh, you can refer to this and ask them to, you know, either notify their customers directly, or sometimes they just take action independently and remove the website. Um, and the web hosts, they often have like a copyright claim or a DMCA process that you can rely upon. Um, so, so depending, I'd say, again, uh, what type of abuse it is, um, look into what the web hosts terms and conditions outline. Sometimes you can also see that the website has been used um, in a scam or there's something uh, on the website, uh, you know, they purport or they impersonate your, your brand. Um, some registrars or domain name resellers, they have, uh, they have processes for filing abusive domain names as well. So you can get the entire website suspended uh, by suspending the actual domain name. So that's more like a technicality um, way of, of closing down a website. Obviously, you can try and also contact the website owner uh, if you're able to find their uh, contact details. Um, sometimes this uh, is easier said than done. Uh, but I mean, if you do, uh, you can ask them to remove, you know, the portion of the website. Uh, some, I'd say some people or some companies, uh, infringers uh, could be quite ignorant uh, to the fact that there is a registered trademark. But if you give them notice, sometimes they will actually uh, the bad website. Um, another option that we discussed earlier is to file a domain name dispute um, if the actual domain name itself is targeting your brand, but this is not really a quick fix. Uh, it takes about two to three months to actually get the, uh, the domain name uh, recovered. But you can do this, I'd say, simultaneously as you try and shut down the website. So if it's... Um, I think we'll discuss it later, but if it's a phishing website, you might want to just take down uh, the website directly and go ahead and actually recover uh, the domain name as well. Uh, let's see. So this is just an example of countries uh, that could be the location of the web post or domain name reseller. Uh, so when I say domain name reseller, I mean domain name registrar. So that's the company that you go to when you sign up for a domain name. And our experience is that uh, in some countries, it's very, very difficult uh, to enforce your rights uh, through the web post or the registrar. So for instance, uh, uh, Russia, Ukraine and Poland, Vietnam, these are just some countries where we, uh, we know it's very uh, cumbersome to actually uh, get your rights enforced. So before you decide on which method to use, we suggest that you look into, okay, so which country is the web post located in or which country is the registrar located in? Are they typically compliant or not? Uh, then you can also decide which alternative or which measure to use. Uh, I know that Ukraine, Russia, and Poland, they often require a local, like a court decision from a local competent court for them to even take action. So, um, so keep that in mind as well. Um, and I'm sure many of you have been uh, facing websites where you have successfully or hopefully successfully been shutting down the website just to learn like the next day uh, uh, that's resurfaced uh, and targeting your brand again and again. Um, but I say nevertheless, so our experience having been, I mean, in this industry for so many years is that it does pay off if you are consistent in enforcing your rights. So Eventually, we know that the infringer, they will never go away, but hopefully they will go after another brand uh, or go after someone else than yours. So even though it might seem it's not worth it, um, we have worked with clients who have been very diligent. Uh, and the trend is that we see they see fewer and fewer cases uh, targeting you know, them at least. So. so we'll just jump into uh, discussing and talking a little bit about domain name disputes. I don't know what's happening here, but it feels like it's it's moving ahead way too quickly. But uh, this is a recap of what uh, Clara showed before. In this case, uh, someone had more or less just copied or mimicked like the official site of the Levi website uh, and decided to create 30 new domain names. So. They created Levi Denmark, Levi Australia, Levi sales in Singapore and so forth. Um, so it's quite common that they just don't register one by one. They would go 
and re register domain names and bundle. Um, and in this case, at least six of the domain names were connected uh, to websites that reproduce content from the official Levi website. So in this case, we're reading the WIPO decision. It wasn't really clear uh, if they took any pre-measures in trying to have uh, the sites taken offline prior to filing the domain name dispute, but um, it appeared that there were many different registrars involved in this case, um, located in countries where we know from experience it's hard to, to get them to, to cancel the domain name. So potentially they tried it, but it didn't work. So they decided to go ahead uh, as well. Um, here is the uh, case with Merck Group in Germany, where someone had been imitating uh, their website by using the same design and the same layout as the official website. Um, and it could also be quite difficult to, to spot, like, is this really an official website or not? Even for us, uh, obviously, because if they just take the, the content directly from the official website, then you need to look at other factors such as the actual domain name, how long has it been registered uh, and so forth. Uh, but, but in this case, it was actually clear and it was stated in the decision or in the under the factual grounds that, um, that they also filed a domain name uh, or filed a takedown notice uh, with, the, with the web host. So by the time they actually submitted the complaint, uh, the website was down already, uh, but they still wanted to get control um, over the domain name. So I'll hand over to Clara to talk a little bit about statistics from one of the dispute providers. Yes, so WIPO um, is the, uh, the dispute resolution provider that handles the most CRP cases by far. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> And as you can see, the number of UWP cases they handle each year has dramatically increased, um, particularly after the pandemic. And uh, we uh, don't know the exact reasons to this, of course, but very likely it's because more and more domains are registered. So there's just more opportunity to, to do infringements on websites. And um, there's also um, a lot more cyber squatting uh, incidents, I'd say uh, cyber security issues overall. Um, and uh, I think, well, we think there's an increased awareness of the UDRP, like you can actually use it also. So a lot of factors, um, but I don't think it's only that there's more and more cyber squatting. I think it's also that more and more people are aware that they can use the UDRP. Yes. So why would you file a domain name dispute um, even? Like it takes a few months, what's uh, <laughs> it's quite a long time compared to trying to shut down the website. Um, well, we would typically like, unless it's a domain name uh, address that you really want, which is usually not the case when we get involved, uh, we would try website takedown first because it's usually quicker and, uh, and cheaper if it works. Um, but if you try that, it doesn't work. Um, and maybe you've tried sending cease and desist letters, no response. Um, it could also be if you, you know, maybe this is a recurring uh, If you've seen this person before or entity, if you first seen you, um, some clients want to, then they, you know, put their foot down and say, okay, we're going to dispute the domain nine names now. So we, you know, we take over these domains and hopefully um, that's going to make them. Go for some other brand owner, which is good. That's the same information. Um, it could also be that one person or entity owns a lot of domains, and this is becoming much more common than just a few years ago. It's quite rare that <clears throat> someone will register just one domain name. It's often like 20, 30, 50 domains. Um, so it, it can be an effective way to get all of them in one go. Um, and of course, for most, it's also a way to, to get this domain uh, without having to go to court, which is a lot more costly. Yes. So again, to recap, so pros and cons of domain name disputes. The domain name dispute, the outcome is that you gain ownership of the domain. Um, that's permanent. Uh, a website takedown, you know, it can be permanent, but since 
like Celia explained, it's often up to the web host or the registrar whether you know they feel like complying with this request. There's no common set of rules like for a domain name dispute. So it's really hard to say unless you work with the ministry, like do we think this party is going to comply or not? Is it going to stay there? or are they going to allow their client to just put this website up somewhere else in two weeks or tomorrow? Uh, so um, it can work, but it can also pop back up. Um, yes. Yeah, so what is the recommendations to, to trademark owner? I'd say, um, as we discussed before, uh, first try to detect it uh, through various online tools that are out there. I know some might be uh, available for free. Um, other you need to subscribe and, and pay a certain fee for, but definitely use some, some sort of watch services for, for early detection and early enforcement uh, of your rights. Um, and also be proactive. It's, it's always good to register some domain names in countries where you know you have presence or that you will expand to uh, in the future, just to make sure that not a third party goes ahead and, and grab those, especially if you have applied for trademark. Uh, we see that quite often. Uh, make sure that you register the domain name before you register or apply for the trademark. Otherwise, someone else will. Um, and uh, yeah. And that will take a lot of time and it's very costly to recover those domain names uh, once you detect them. Um, what else? Follow up policy. Yes, this is something that we highly recommend uh, to our clients, knowing where to spend the money and what to enforce. Uh, hopefully your companies will grow uh, a lot bigger than where you are today. Uh, and so it's important to, to learn and also to set some standards internally for what you should take action on and, and when to take action. Um, so it, you don't make decisions uh, day by day, but rather that you have a strategic, I'd say like a strategic uh, policy that sort of dictates what's important for the business now, what's important in five years uh, and so forth. Um, obviously, uh, if you could, you like to register everything, you like to protect everything, but you can. So it's it's also important to know where to spend uh, the money in the right way, so to speak. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think that sort of wraps up what we had from from Silka, if I yeah, if I remember correctly. Yeah. But obviously, we we leave the the floor open to any questions uh, towards the end after uh, Iris have sort of wrapped up everything. So thank you for for having us. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to 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 everybody. Uh, Rosa, Mariana, Cecilia, and and uh, Clara for excellent uh, presentations. I think um, now we could uh, open the the floor for for some uh, some questions and uh, discussion on the topic. I know at least in in Ornamos um, uh, member advising that. Uh, uh, enforcing rights is is a very very hot topic there so so hopefully we will have um designers utilizing this this fantastic opportunity to to ask questions so you can do that by um uh raising your your hand uh and uh, and then uh asking your questions directly or in case you would like to um just use the the chat function uh that's a possibility as well and then i can read out the questions um to to our expert guests here so yes is there is there anybody who would directly like to like to uh ask their questions Um, yeah, I, I will uh, wait for a little bit if there will be some some uh, uh, questions in the in the chat uh, version. But uh, in in the meantime, I can I can ask some of the questions that I I hear a lot in in uh, in in our member advising, and um, maybe this this one goes more to to Marianna. Like one one question that I I hear sometimes from from designers is that. 
um, wh why would I, I bother to register my design that is, uh, that costs and I have to decide in which countries to, to register when, when I can get uh, copyright for free. So do you have any, any tips on, on the enforcement side on, on the differences between, uh, uh, enforcing, uh, design rights versus copyrights? Well, obviously they they probably they tackle a bit of a different different things. Also, design uh, protection and copyright protection. Copyright protection um, protects the creation of uh, cr the creation created work. Uh, it's more about the the um, the freedom of of creator there, um, and. It's not really um, an effective uh, protection method for, let's say, uh, everyday ordinary products. Whereas the design right, or for example, for trademarks, the three D uh, registration is much more effective that you actually can enforce, and you have also at that point the understanding or on on what is being protected also at that point. So I, I I would I would say that they are not that expensive for you to 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 try to establish your right to understand what it is, the limits of the rights and and to to have a better legal status for your design. Yes, yes, indeed, and uh, and and like you mentioned there, the it's it it is unclear whether whether you even even have the the right uh, to begin with, which is something that then yeah. you um, uh, might have to end up doing in in court, uh, cl claiming in the first place that you 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 have a right. So so this mm. this from from the cost saving point of view, it's it's it 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 ends up ends up the other way very very fast when, when... very fast, unfortunately, yes. yes. And also in in um, I I I hear as as also Clara and Cecilia were pointing out the the fact that sometimes it feels like that there are a huge amount of infringers and these counterfeit products just. Even though you take actions, they seem to still arrive. But from my perspective, also it does um, the work done to try to prevent, prevent, and also taking down these counterfeits, stopping them. It does pay off because we don't know what kind of a situation actually would be if you would not take any actions against at all. And secondly, here again, I mentioned the trademarks. The, the stronger you will be able to kind of uh, maintain or grow the, 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 your brand, the reputation of your trademark, the easier it will be for you to, to try to stop the counterfeits back or to try not the consumers not to buy those counterfeits, which is also very important to note. Yes. Um, yes, that, that actually lead, leads me to to a second question, which which also also happens among designers sometimes is that um, somebody might not uh, even utilize a, a a trademark, but register a a domain with the designer's uh, name, uh, and, and you know whether they're uh, putting in official or just using another uh, top level domain in as as kind of the, the after the dot part uh, and and um, have you encountered this kind of situations where uh, instead of a trademark you have a person's name or, or or likeness being used and and how can those be tackled yeah so um yeah so that's also very common um in terms of uh, protecting those names again uh, make sure that you register it uh, directly because otherwise someone else will because it's very difficult to recover those domain names because if your name is not protected in that sense that it's been used commercially or is a trademark name um, you 
you won't be able to succeed because you need to show a standing, which is a right to that specific name if you want to recover a domain name. So if you're a well-known designer, uh, unless you can prove unregistered rights, uh, so if it's a you know, very, very well-known designer and, and been in the business for decades, uh, that's a different story if you can show unregistered rights. But um, if you're a startup company and no one knows you and uh, it's, it's gonna be very difficult. Uh, so make sure to, to also register your personal name in a domain name because at one day you will be famous. <laughs> Hopefully. Was there something? I, I just heard maybe somebody started speaking, but. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Now we have uh, some chat questions. Um, um, and yes, there's there's a question if it if it is okay to ask questions here, even if you're not a member of Ornamo. And the answer here is absolutely yes. This is this is open for for everybody, and and very much a good opportunity to 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 ask questions. Our um, uh, experts. Uh, I would like to know if you have any information on intellectual property rights for modifying existing products or aftermarket customization of products such as um, motorcycles, cars, boats, uh, et cetera, where the original product is protected by the original brand. Um, okay, so a question about modifying existing products. So maybe if I interpret this uh this question correctly, and the the person who asked this can of course um uh, uh modify or, or or change it a bit if i if i interpret this in incorrectly but may maybe my my understanding of the question is if there is a way to uh change possibly design registrations uh after uh, uh after the fact that they've been already in the market and there's typically some some changes made to the uh to the designs that's maybe how i interpret this question. Uh, okay, there's a little bit of extra here. For example, if a customer wants to change the appearance of their product, is it acceptable to redesign parts of, of their product? Okay, which which you're not the owner of. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I will let um, our experts uh, here here to answer answer as well. But then this this typically, of course, is is a is a matter of who is the the original right owner here, and if if it is in accordance with with their permission. So maybe if in case of a a customer wanting to redesign an existing product, are they the right owner? In which case, of course, they can then uh, hire a designer to do do a uh, redesign on that, but. Obviously, this is also an an issue that our designers have have pinpointed is that there there are many times where customers might hire a designer with with the um, the actual uh, uh, intent to to create designs that are close to some some existing designs or kind of utilizing utilizing existing um, uh, appeal of the market. Uh, so so of course, in this case, it is very important to figure out if if the customer who wants to redesign a product is actually the right owner or has the right owner's permission here but um yeah i will i will also let our our experts to to answer these this question if you have comments well i i think if i if i would understand uh, if i'm understanding this now correctly that let's say that there is a I'm I'm gonna now refer to a, a shoe. Uh, I I bought a pair of shoes and um, they are of a designer brand. And I I'm gonna take it to uh to uh, another shoemaker and I'm gonna ask them to modify the pair of shoes that I have bought. And they will I I need to change some, something or add a piece of fabric or something like that. And as they are my shoes, I can do, uh, I can ask them to do that if I'm now understanding correctly. But obviously, um, 
it's a different thing of modifying something that somebody owns already for them, but then commercially you to exploit that further, then there is maybe a, a other other um, elements to taking into consideration. But kind of if, if if that car that you are modifying and bring it from the request of the person who has bought the car, um, I don't think that there would necessarily be any issues of that. Or what do, do you agree, Iris, on Well, if if I understood it now correctly, but yes, it, 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 it's I, I more, also just now it, there. I think yeah, there's it, yeah. two possible yeah. ways to exactly like this if, if it was that, yes. then then yeah. if it's your jacket, if it's your your uh, your product, uh, uh, you can do it's yours. You can do whatever you want with it. You can modify it to how however you want. Yes, yeah. So I I, I think uh, yeah. There's there's this. Uh, this this way of of understanding the question as well. If we're talking about just the physical product that you bought and you are modifying that that product, and especially if you're modifying that for your own personal use, then that is that is obviously a very very different case than in case you want to uh, modify the design and then start selling that design. So so um, uh, yes. Okay, let's let's see if we get um, more questions. And as as I mentioned, absolutely very much um, uh, uh, open to everybody answer or ask questions, not just uh, Ornamo Ornamo members. Um, yes, uh, one one other um, uh, design. Uh, related question that sometimes I, I hear from, from designers. Uh, so uh, again, a, a bit more of the uh, a legal question for, for Marianna, but, but sometimes um, designers uh, do feel that uh, it's, it's not possible to in, in enforce design rights because any small change uh, by another uh, company uh, will will immediately mean that the the design is is not considered the uh, uh, infringing. So so uh, there's there's a lot of this kind of um, maybe maybe mis misunderstanding of of how does it work when when another product is is uh, uh, compared and and this evaluation process that you you mentioned earlier so uh, uh can you comment a little little bit more on the um on the how how is this evaluation uh process done and does it is it really so that any small change to a design means that you cannot enforce your rights No, it doesn't mean that every small uh, detail uh, would change the the overall appearance of the design so much that similarity could not be found. Um, as as I as I said earlier, it is the the evaluation is done through the eyes of a of an informed user who is relatively well aware of the sec like what kind of designs are in in the specific sector that that we would be evaluating but it's not an expert so it doesn't know all the details that went into that um, obviously there like it's always comes down to the overall impression but then obviously taking into consideration as i said the possible is if if something arrives from the the technical need of the design or or and also obviously the 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 freedom that the the creator of the design was able to use in order to create it. So like if overall appearance, we find that something could have been done in so many different ways. Then when comparing the similarity of those two, we have to question why it's been done so similarly. Then yes, when there would have been so many other ways of of uh, of creating that same de design. So we can focus on 
on the similarities rather than necessarily on the tiny details that would separate the designs from each other. Yes, exactly. I think there, there are in certain fields these cases where um, there is there is uh, less maneuver for the design decisions, and maybe mm -hmm. some of these cases have created this impression that this is somehow a general rule that a a small change would would yes. make it, it's it's considered a, a different design. But that's like 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 you said, Mariana, that's that's uh, always uh, evaluated in the in the field and in the the freedom that the designer has has yes. for that that product. So so yeah. Yeah, it's about that um that impression that is created in that sp specific uh field so so you, you can't always say that okay in this case there was this this sm small change that was considered significant enough that doesn't uh transfer necessarily to to another uh product it's uh i think with uh, uh in all I ipr in the i feel the ipr it's, uh, as i said about the public's opinion it's it's difficult and um, sometimes as the kind of public's opinion on, on if something is similar or different, it might be completely different from the fact that how the actual case is interpreted through the legislation and the and existing case law. And, and that I know it creates unnecessary confusion on on uh, I'm sure with designer designers among designers also that it's hard to to know if you have not uh, um, kind of received information on how these things are actually evaluated. Yeah. Uh, then I have a question for uh, Cecilia and Clara. If you have any kind of general um, advice on when, when you are first uh, registering your, your domain, if, if you have this kind of uh, top level domains that you you always recommend or kind of how many variations you typically uh, recommend that your your customers register their their domains to kind of cover their bases as, as well as possible and as efficiently as possible. <laughs> the very boring answer is like, it depends, you know, <clears throat> of course. Uh, but this goes back a little bit to um, what Cecilia talked about. Um, but very general answer would be uh, definitely have like the core brand, like your core maybe company name, maybe depending on how famous the company name is, but the, the product names and the brands in definitely.com, of course. Um, I'd say it's like the info business, they're not that relevant anymore. Maybe do uh, the relevant email uh, details. There are like hundreds of these generic ones, like .app, .shop, .online. Um, there are lists of these in many places. You can just pick out the ones that are really relevant to your industry, you know, business. because otherwise, there are like, so many. Um, and then, um, no, I would, we generally recommend like just do the important ones and then have a monitoring service. Because other, I mean, you can register thousands and thousands, and there are simply so new. And variations you keep up with if you're very creative, which they are. So let's say any obvious uh, easy slips on the keyboard, maybe for your main brand. If if you have like an, I don't know, if you notice that people type in your website wrong, for example, or someone tells you, oh, I got to this, got to the wrong one, um, maybe such. Uh, typos. It depends a little bit also on the industry. I'd say if you're in finance or uh, you know insurance, maybe you're more prone to get phishing. Um, and then I need to look at okay, what would be what would look like my email address? And in those situations, like I and L and one are very common to exchange because they look so similar when you an email from you know, maybe the CEO's name or or. Um, HR, we've had a lot of job scams lately. Um, All right, can I just, it, I don't know, the sound goes back and forth when, when I don't know if it's just on my computer, but the sound oh, sorry. goes. Well, can you hear Clara clearly or is it just me? No, it it's be. there's a little bit of uh, an audio. Uh, so maybe okay. Let me try Let me try to talk straight to my computer. I'll see if it yes. works. Otherwise, yeah. you have to jump in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I just, I wasn't sure if it was just me or if it's. All right. Uh, can you, you know. hear me now? Yes. 
Can yes. hear you? Yes. Okay, I can't hear you, but that's fine. <laughs> as long as you can hear me. Um, yeah, so we'd say um, any markets, any geographical markets where you have presence right now, uh, both when it comes to sales, but also production, like manufacturing. Because we've noticed that we, we see a lot of infringements in Vietnam, for example, and that's, of course, because there are a lot of factories and uh, production there. So sales and manufacturing, like countries, um, and if you have like a vague idea where you may want to be within five years, we'll take those as well, um, like defensively. And then have a, have a watch service, like a detection service is definitely cheaper than registering everything you can think of. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And have a policy. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have. Uh, yeah, it, it it was it was better uh, better yeah. without the mic. Yeah, we have a a question in the in the chat uh, asking if I start a clothing brand, should I sign an uh, mm -hmm. intellectual property rights agreement with the factory first, or should I register my brand before manufacturing? What do you recommend? Shall I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maya, where you go? <laughs> um, well, um, should I register my brand first? Is your brand, okay, uh, establishing a company, first of all, uh, already with the, with the name of the company, you should take time of considering what is the name of your company. Uh, is this brand now the same as your company name, for example, or are you using a, a different company name with you um, than the brand name then will be? Are you signing the the agreement with the company name already? I would uh, I would think think that you have a company name first that is then maybe the same as your brand also. Um, I would go registering the brand. Obviously, um, I don't know where where the where the factory, for example, it would be. Are they are they using and labeling your clothes already accordingly with the brand? So they are actually using it already. Also, there are 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 things things to consider in relation to the agreement for which which uh, reason I I would say that you you register you declare your right to your brand first i can also briefly comment because i talk about this often with designers in ornamos legal consultation service and and often this question comes up uh, should i register my trademark before starting and and mm -hmm. usually uh, with the IP rights, I always recommend uh, what you said that it's it's good to take a time to consider what you, mm -hmm. what name you want to use, what brand. Um, with design registration that was talked about before, it's important to register the design before publishing, but because mm -hmm. novelty is one of the uh, re registration requirements but with trademarks the you can register also later but from a brand protection point of view uh, when you start building your brand there will be interest interested actors in the market who want to also also uh, benefit from from the brand you have created so I I often recommend that that you would register your rights and then make the contracts very carefully. And I wanted to uh, refer to our previous webinar about licensing agreements uh, to check that out to make sure that you know the difference uh, when making the the agreement of whether you give your intellectual property right uh, an IP transfer, uh, all the rights to to the the other party, or you give a license to them that they can use for example the brand uh it's very important to consider this before mm -hmm. before entering the agreement definitely and, and in in um, most of the countries worldwide uh trademarks are registered first like are served first come first so if somebody uh, go, uh registers or oh, applies for the name before you then they have it there is not 
a way for you to to get it back without any kind of negotiation or anything that obviously then again takes money and time um secondly with registration also you have to be be careful on uh, when when we go to international uh waters um there are unfortunately uh, chinese companies following especially the us trademark uh, trade register what is being filed there and if you are very unlucky they might file something in china so and then for you getting it back in china it's going to be very difficult because they have registered maybe the trademark before you in china in that in 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 that case so if there is any possibility of you when you are entering the international markets that you have you will be having manufacturing or selling uh, or something in china then that is one of the most crucial crucial ones to be uh, filing a trademark for your brand yes and and when deciding on the brand name or the trademark do some searches to see if the domains are free if there are trademarks already registered uh, in that territory where you wish to register it to make these searches and and it's i often also recommend to contact the Yes, like attorney to to help yeah. with the registration that, process. Yes, process, that is know. a yes, also, that is a whole whole other other field uh, yeah. field another <laughs> seminar for even yeah like, finding a finding a, a free name finding a, a new that no one actually has not registered yet at the moment is 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 quite difficult. We are we are we are not. We're ending up uh, not having enough names uh, for for trademarks. <laughs> yes. Yes, and um, well, that I think that's a a good um, uh, intro as well for for the uh, next question of, of uh, on on domain registrations that. Do you find many times that there are similar domain registrations that um, are kind of legitimate in the sense that nobody is trying to uh, to in infringe on anybody's rights, but still create confusion? And if there's there are ways to kind of tackle these situations. Yeah, again, I mean, given the number of domain names out there, uh, there are always going to be uh, sort of collisions on domain names as well. Uh, but again, regarding, I guess it's it's the balance between uh, the confusion um, where you need to take into account when you actually want to recover a domain name, because there are still three criteria that you need to, to meet uh, no matter what. So even though you think it's confusingly similar, um, a panelist might not consider it being so just because you're a well-known company or well-known brand uh you don't you can't just assume that you have rights to everything that contains your you know your trademark which some companies do um so it's still important to make sure that you fulfill those criteria under the udrp we did not go through them today in detail that's also a different whole different seminar uh but there are a lot of domain name owners who have legitimate interest in domain names and you can register it's also uh, for so um, if if you create a website and you keep it there temporarily um, or you create a fan site for I'm just making something up like uh, Ikea shop dot uh, dot com for instance uh, and you just put up a website there and you registered it in good faith um, and then all of a sudden two years down the road uh, you start using it for selling Ikea uh, products uh, unauthorized um, it's hard to do something because you registered the domain name in good faith so this is like um, a two-fold uh, criteria under the UDRP where you need to show registered and used in bad faith so so this is also something that you need to uh, be very cautious of uh, when, when you want to file a UDRP I don't know if that answered the questions really but yes there are a lot of like legitimate websites that still creates confusion um so if you cannot take down the website based on you know copyright or trademark or any other abusive use of the domain name then 
uh, then it can be very, very tricky to do to do anything really. Just to, to pitch in on that, if you can hear me, okay, can you? Yes. Yeah. So it, <clears throat> about a month or two ago, we had um two like webinars of maybe four to five minutes uh, each uh, on this topic on maybe your piece. So if anyone's interested in a lot more details. Uh, on UDRPs and, and local variations of it. You can just um, contact us, email us, and we can send you links to those webinars. Yes, fantastic to hear. Um, yeah. Um, let me check if there's any more questions in the in the chat. Uh, I, I think to to kind of um, summarize and, and wrap up, um, uh, discussing about in, in enforcing rights and uh, in in your presentation, uh, Silica, uh, you, you mentioned enforcement policy. So maybe if if you're you're both able to give kind of uh, you know the do at least these few things kind of uh, tips for for designers and and maybe kind of the the smaller companies who who uh, have. More restricted resources typically than 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 bigger companies. And what are the kind of like few easy ways uh, to to uh, make sure that um, you're you're um, enforcing your rights and and kind of able to do that in a in a in a somewhat efficient efficient way. So so any kind of uh, uh, last last tips on on enforcement. Well, I, I can start. Well, number one, it doesn't have to do with enforcement, but number one is knowing about them, right? So there are quite a few free tools. Just Google online, like free domain name monitoring, free logo watch, free, you know, you can um, you can uh, detect, like if someone's using your images, which I assume like contain your designs, um, it's your original picture. So, that's number one, but then also just have the have the basics covered. If you have that, um, if I just go on the on the domain side, which is not specifically designed, but uh, I would check if you get a lot of infringements. This maybe also doesn't apply to tiny ones, but regardless, I would check: uh, are there MX records? Like, are there email records? If if there's only a URL, you discover the domain name, but there's nothing on the website. You may wonder, okay. <laughs> What are they going to have this for? It's just a, a dead website. Um, how can you check whether they're sending out emails? Um, well, you can't know if they are unless you have been informed about it um, just by yourself. But you can check if they have MX records. So that means that email functionality has been enabled on this. Um, and someone can email from this. Uh, so that's very common when you look at domain names. Also, it applies a bit more to bigger companies. Like if someone wants to impersonate you or contact your clients and, and ask for a, you know, or offer a refund, for example, and they just need your account details so they can refund you. <laughs> yeah, things like that. Um, so I would check for uh, MX workers and also like Cecilia said, check where the web host is. There's a lot of online cheap or free tools for that. Where is the web host? Um, of course, contact us <laughs> if you have to. But, uh, um yeah, they often have they have online forms you can just fill out and, and start there. And I think just to add to that, I think like the a trademark policy goes hand in hand with a domain name policy. So that should sort of yeah. correlate. Uh so where you have your trademark protected, make sure that you have your domain names protected and vice versa. Um, so I think that's really important. Also, some countries do require that you have a trademark registration in place to actually enforce your rights uh, under a certain domain name dispute process. So, so that's also important. Um, so that's something yeah. that obviously um, people in the industry are, are aware of and also the cyber squatters are aware of. Um, they know exactly which countries to register under because they know it's very difficult to. Uh, to gain or recover a domain name there. So, so yeah, so your trademark policy and, and domain name that goes hand in hand. If I, so personally, sorry. No, so, 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 sorry, Clara. I, I, wanted to, no. I wanted to, for trademarks, I wanted to then add also the company name or auxiliary name or yes. business names also. Mm -hmm. So having the domain registered 
with the name of your company or if you have auxiliary names uh, which Finland for example is very very common common so having the domain names equal to to those is also is is wise to think about definitely yeah yes thank you Mariana do you have any any uh last tips you want to share Mm, well, I guess there could be quite a, quite a lot. We, I guess, we cannot uh, in like in more strongly advise to 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 try to understand the the rights that you have. Um, authority websites are a good place of finding information. As I said, there is the. Um, EUIPO is providing the SME fund, and in Finland also IP scan. Um, I think uh, the the I don't remember what the re reimbursement rate is, but I think it's for one thousand euros. But and this is to experts, uh, attorneys, uh, um, uh, European trademark attorneys, or they are evaluating what kind of IPR in your company there would be. Um, to take advantage of if you are present in, in online marketplaces, to take advantage and to knowledge yourself with the tools that they have for monitoring and also the takedown, because this is, this is the guidelines are very uh, detailed and this is something that can easily be done. Um, I guess, shall we go with this? Yes. As a final words. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. I think this was a, a really great session that showed how how uh, intellectual property rights are very linked to very practical ways uh, that you are you you are protecting your your business and uh, your your intellectual property. So uh, I think this was a, a great way to uh, to sum up also a, a lot of points that were were made in the the earlier webinars about the importance of of uh, registering your your rights and understanding this as 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 a whole and and not just uh, as a single single um, registrations or or protection forms but but really as a as a, a holistic way to to protect your uh, assets and uh, and um, business interests. Okay, I think we will wrap up now. Um, I don't see any more more questions in the in the chat or or any uh, any raised hands anywhere. So yeah, uh, I would very much like to uh, thank everybody who participated and took this time uh, to join in our webinar, and especially a very very warm thanks to to our. Uh, guests, expert guests this time, Marianna, Clara, and Cecilia, and, and Rosa also for, for joining us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.